welcome to another video um, with Katie's Shelf Life. It's Thursday, December 29th. It is um, close to 80 degrees today here in Houston and it's raining. So I feel very tired because we've had very up and down weather. We've gone from being super cold um, and windy to being this. So it's one of those days where I feel tired. I take it easy today. Um, did a little bit of reading, and then I decided I'm done reading books for the year. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm done reading for the year. Um, I'm just going to take it easy the next few days that I have left a um, break for the new year. Watch some shows, maybe um, spend time with family. Um, we've been getting a lot of house projects done. And yeah, I kind of just want to take it easy before I start all my... January reading and get into the new year and I feel like I'll be really motivated once the new year starts. I'm kind of losing some momentum, which I feel like most of us are at this point. So it's, you know, not a big deal. I decided to do a December 22, 2022 reading wrap up. I did bring my iPad just because I wrote out some stuff and I think it'll help me stay on track. All right, we've got our tea. We've got our stack of books. So I only read four books this month, which honestly I'm fine with. Um, I was sick at the very end of November, which kind of carried over into December. I was sick for like two weeks. Um, so I didn't really start off the month reading too heavily. Um, going from my least favorite to favorite read. Not that any of these were bad. It's just the order that I thought was easier to get my thoughts out. And it's kind of fun to end it on a high note because I feel like the two books that are at the top of my list this month are really, really strong. So um, first up, we've got, this is the one I just finished this morning, but this is by Tove Ditlison, translated from the Danish by Tina Nunnally. So I really loved the Copenhagen trilogy when I read it last year. It's, um, Ditlison's memoir in three parts. It's childhood, youth, and dependency. I really loved reading those more than I enjoyed reading this. Not that it wasn't good. I honestly think that... I wasn't in the mood to read this. I was trying to reach that arbitrary goal of 60 books read before the end of the year and it's kind of felt a bit bored. I it just wasn't what I was in the mood for and I maybe should have just gone with my instinct and put it down but it was a short read so I pushed through. Not that it was bad I just it just wasn't the right time for me to read it. So in this we follow Lisi who's a children's book writer living in Copenhagen in 1968. She is haunted by disembodied faces and voices. Um, she's talk constantly talking about faces, the faces of those around her, her own face. The faces sometimes have voices attached and other times don't. Um, she overdoses on pills to escape her cheating husband and housekeeper for fear they are plotting against her. She ends up in a hospital where the nurses and doctors' faces take on those of her family members and she believes to hear voices coming from a microphone inside her pillowcase. We as the reader do not fully understand what is real for Lisi while in the hospital. Even the ending um, left me with a lot of questions. And I think that was intentional. I don't really know what is real when she's in the hospital. Like we don't ever really, to me, it's never really clear if she's actually hearing voices or if she's being gaslit in a way. Yeah, I could see how it can be interpreted as all of it was possibly real or could be real. But Lisi getting out of her home and being in a hospital gives her a sense of freedom. She believes hearing voices might be what saves her and finds comfort from the faces and voices she hears and sees. Um, she feels like while she's in the hospital um, and is hearing voices that while the nurses and doctors are telling her like, if you continue to say that you're hearing things, you will stay here, like you won't get to leave. And to her, she's like, well, I, I don't really want to leave. She feels uninspired while she's living at home. Like she can't write. She's, her housekeeper is always setting aside time for her to write and to take away things from her, um, like her household and motherly duties so that she can write. She tells people, uh, Lisi can't have visitors because she is busy writing and none of that is true. She is not writing. She has not been able to write for I think like two years since her first children's book came out. Um, and while she's in the hospital, she does feel that she can begin to write again. She feels a sense of freedom in her insanity. Um, and I don't honestly know how I feel about that. I understand that this was written in the late sixties and our understanding of mental illness and mental health and, um, depression and creativity and like the creative, um, the tortured genius that has all kind of 
we understand a bit more and we don't glamorize it or, you know, it is glamorized at times. We hopefully try to understand why it shouldn't be glamorized. But um, in the back of the book, it says, is insanity really something to be feared or does it bring a kind of freedom? And all I can think about is basically how romanticized mental illness is in the creative mind. Um, so yeah, I had a hard time with this book. It's hard to tell what's real and what's not, what's in her head, what is not. Um, and if you've read her memoir, especially on dependency, the last, the third part of the memoir, it, there's a lot of similarities between them. This says a lot about the time period of the late 60s and mental health, um, especially when it concerns women. But yeah, it just wasn't for me. It's not bad, but... I don't know after reading the Copenhagen trilogy I just kind of wanted a bit more and this just seemed to kind of repeat the same thing over and over of you know she was hearing things she was experiencing things in the hospital she was hallucinating um this her, the husband and the housekeeper were out to get her and it was just kind of for being so short I kind of feel like it hit some of the same things over and over again but if you enjoyed the Copenhagen Trilogy, especially if you, I don't know if you can say you enjoyed the Dependency, but if you enjoyed your time reading it, I think then you would enjoy The Faces. Take a sip of tea. I really like this tea. It's uh, by Tea Pigs. There's the, I don't know if you can see it, but it's Honeybush and Roboy. And I don't really like tea with cream and sugar, but this one with a little bit of sugar, raw sugar, and then a little splash of, or kind of a, a decent splash of oat milk. It tastes like, it's a decaf tea, which is great. But it has like a, um, the same sort of comforting feeling as like a, a coffee. It's really good. I think that's what I needed with some tea. It's raining right now. And yeah, this is great. Next book is <laughs> Pond by Claire Louise Bennett. I did on my very first reading vlog, I um, I was rereading Pond. So it's a reread for me from 2017. I didn't really fully understand it. Um, I had just gotten really back into reading and I think I kind of, I knew this was making the rounds online and on Bookstagram and I decided to pick it up and it just kind of went over my head. So I decided to give it another shot. I enjoyed my time with it, but it's still not a book that I love. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to do a third read of it. Um, it just didn't hold my attention throughout. And I don't know why that is. It could have been, again, the time I was reading it, I could have gone into it with preconceived notions of knowing that I didn't fully click with it the first time. And I kind of went in thinking, I'm probably not going to click with it again or understand it again. But whatever it was, um, the writing was beautiful. And in my first reading blog, which I'll probably link somewhere up here, um, if you want to check that out, I go into more depth and what I did connect with from this novel. And I will say that the things that I connected with it um, from that vlog are still what I kind of am holding on to from this book. So in that way, it was a positive reread. But um, from what I read about her newest novel, Check Out 19, I think I'm going to enjoy that a bit more. And it is on my list of books to read for 2023. So I'm hoping to get to that soon, but I think I'm going to enjoy it more. Um, it seems to have a little bit more of a, not that I necessarily need plot in a book, but it does seem to have a bit more of a plot while this, um, we fall an unnamed narrator, a young woman living in a small coastal village. Um, you can read this book straight through as a novel or each chapter as a short story. It's an extremely interior novel from a clean, keenly observant narrator telling us her thoughts on the most mundane of things like oat cakes and bananas. And she creates an entire world through her descriptions. I found all of that really beautiful. I loved it. I loved the interiority of it. I loved the detail. It's meandering, but at times the meandering, I think I have one of those per brains where my brain on its own meanders a lot. I was reading and things were meandering and I was like, wait, I just felt like, again, like the first time I read it, I was reading the words, but I wasn't understanding the what was being said, um, which is really frustrating for me. And I feel like I want to be someone who can really um, attach themselves to writing in that style because I feel it's how my mind works, but it just doesn't always click with me. And some books it does, but this one, it's just one that I, I'm, 
and you stop trying to fight it, it's just not gonna click. Uh, but if you love thoughtful writing and you know plot isn't really a big deal to you then i think this is a great book and i know tons of people love this book i feel that i'm in the camp of being in the middle with it it's not bad it's not it's not my favorite book i've ever read i know plenty of people love this book so it's great writing i will keep reading more of claire louise bennett's work because i do enjoy her writing so much and i am really hopeful for checkout 19. but there is pond by claire louise bennett so now we're getting into my favorites. I'm probably going to get a bit worrier with these ones, but it's because I had a lot more to say when I like a book. It's just easier to talk about and easier to write about. So without further ado, it is Boyfriends, a memoir by Michael Pedersen. I loved this memoir. Michael Pedersen is a Scottish poet and author. Um, this memoir is about male friendship. Um, it is mainly focused on the friendship he had with Scott Hutchinson, who was the lead singer of the Scottish band Fright and Rabbit, whose music I really love. Michael and Scott developed a friendship and collaborated on projects, and Scott illustrated some of Michael's poetry collections. Hutchinson took his life in 2018 after struggling with mental illness. Boyfriends is about grief and loss, what grief is allowed to look like societally, especially for males, and how grief fits into ideas of masculinity. What I loved about this memoir is how Pedersen talks about male friendship as not only looking one way, and that was being the hyper-masculine, often deemed appropriate way to interact with other males. Parts of this novel that I would love to share with young men, because I work in an all-boys school, um, is to show them that being vulnerable with each other is showing strength, to cry with other men, to hold hands with them, and deeply feel with them. I think we have no issue with women displaying these types of affections between girlfriends, but this behavior is never encouraged in men. It's always like a slap on the back and like a, I'm here for you. And I don't know, it just lacks this depth, this like love, this deep vulnerability. But while Boyfriends is Patterson writing and working through his grief over Hutchinson, we also read stories from Pettison, Pet, uh, from, I'm just gonna say Michael, from, from Michael as a young boy and the deep and loving friendships he has had over the years. Some of the stories he shares are hilarious as he fumbles his way through his youth in Scotland as an overly sensitive boy who pursues a career as a lawyer and leaves his well-paying job to be a writer, which was his true passion. This memoir is a love letter to male friendship and the male friendships that have transformed Pedersen in his life. Um, Pedersen handles the subject of suicide and mental illness really beautifully um, in this memoir and never says anything about Hutchinson's personal struggles since those are things that Pedersen can never fully know or understand and it's not his story to tell or the story that he is trying to tell. He does do a beautiful job describing what grief is like for someone who loses a person they love because of mental illness. And um, Michael carries Scott with him everywhere he goes. And the book is really him, or the memoir is really him trying to understand that grief, how to move forward without this deep friendship and this deep love that he had for someone and continues to have. Um, and the moments that they shared and they weren't friends for a very long period of time, but it was like a deep and intense love and a sharing of life. And they're just, it's him just really trying to reflect and grapple and remember all of these good moments that they had. And up until the last moment they were together, which was like a day um, before Scott's um, suicide. And it's just him like having a conversation with uh, Scott, trying to tell him about how his life is going and all the things he's doing and seeing that he wishes he could do and see. And he just wants the simple experiences and um, moments with his friend again, uh, like sharing a meal of oysters over good wine. Like that is something that is a, like multiple times is a hilarious um, like anecdote is them going out for these lavish seafood dinners of oysters and this elusive wine that they always try and find and it's just like a really beautiful story of friendship and male friendship and I think there's like a part towards the end where Michael is walking and he runs into an old friend who he hadn't seen in a long time and uh, finds out that that friend had also had it just experienced um, some losses of family members in his life but he asked, he asked Michael like how he's doing and 
they have this moment of connection of this grief um, and they're experiencing it in two completely different ways, but they're still dealing with grief and how they have this moment of just intimacy and connection. And yeah, it was just really, it's really beautiful. It's funny at times. Like it's actually really quite hilarious at times. Um, they get into somewhat criminal activity together and um, yeah, it's just her. Let's see. So the very like little beginning blurb there is ever feel like you were fated to be friends with someone an alchemy in your meeting instant fondness fondness part chemical part kismet. This is how I felt about every friend I've fallen in love with none so much as you. So yeah, that is boyfriends by Michael Pedersen. All right. The last book on my list is my favorite book that I read this month. Um, honestly, it should have been, if I read it maybe a little bit earlier, it probably would have ended up on my favorite books of 2022, but alas, I read it after I made that video because I was an eager beaver and I just went for it. But this is a great book. This is my favorite book of the month. Definitely, I think should, let's just put it on the, my favorite books of the year as well. So, um, but it is Paradise Rot by Jenny Ball is translated from the Norwegian by Marjan Idris. If you can see, but I have folded over a ton of pages, top and bottom in this book. There are so many gorgeous sentences. It is one of, the, it's up there as one of the most beautifully written books that I have read all year. Probably up there with Cold Enough for Snow and it's just absolute beauty in its sentences. Um, the setting of this book is fantastic. Like if a book was trying to be like trying to tick some boxes of what I will love, place as character 100% happens. It, it happened in this book. Um, let me stop gushing about place and get into the story. But the place, the, 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 the apartment that they live in, the characters in this book is an absolutely living biological alive structure. It is so cool. Okay. This book is about the sexual awakening of our narrator, Joe, who has left home to attend university in a new country and study biology. So Joe needs a place to stay and the only place she can find is with Carol, who is an office temp a few years older than Joe, who lives in an old brewery that has been converted into a living space with walls that don't reach the top of the ceiling. It Jo is an observer throughout the novel. She is the scientist and the space she lives in, she studies as well as her roommate, Carol. Jo can hear Carol do everything in the apartment. She can hear her breathing. Um, she smells everything. She can smell everything in the kitchen. If there's a scene with apples that begin to rot, like she can smell the rotting of the apples, the fermenting of the apples in her bedroom. Um, she can hear Carol using the restroom. And I will say that this novel does have a lot of urine talk, bodily fluids. And I never found it gratuitous. It wasn't anything over the top. I don't feel that it was unnecessary to the story. I do feel is a part of the story that fit in because it is a biological thing that we do. And Joe is a biologist. So bodily fluids to her take on this very scientific and observational view and understanding and not just like a like gross thing or a dirty thing. Ooh. It's rare to get thunder in the winter. Exciting. Um, so yeah, if that's something that is a turn off to you, then I just want to tell you, but I don't think that it is ever over the top or gratuitous or unnecessary to the story. Um, so things start getting strange in the apartment. Um, Carol brings home a bag of apples, which after a few days begin to rot. Bugs and mildew creep into the apartment as slow decay, and then every surface the, of the apartment is covered in grass, moss, mold, condensation, and tiny mushrooms start to sprout up from in between the floorboards near the bathtub. Um, however, none of this seems to bother Jo. She just continues noticing and studying the changes. Jo is depicted as an innocent. She is young and in a new place and is just discovering herself. And Carol is depicted as temptation. 
um, there is a true sexual awakening. Um, there's an even better video done by Books and Bow, and I can link that below or somewhere up here that I think is like, I, I watched that video right after finishing reading and yeah, it, that is a wonderful breakdown of this novel and I will link it because I think it's definitely worth watching. Um, and I don't feel that I'm going to do as great of a job ex, um, explaining parts of this novel as I think that video will do. So while the apartment seems to be rotting, it's transforming. New things are coming from the rot. This is not a rotting paradise, but a paradise of growth and discovery for Joe and Carol. Um, so it is like this garden. It's this garden of filth and it's this beautiful rotting garden to these two women discovering each other. Um, I would happily reread this book. I think there's so much that I would get from it again on a reread and a deep in a deeper understanding and I just highly highly recommend it. I think it is some of the best writing I've read this year. Um, there are some great themes. There's a book within this book that Carol is reading. Um, it's like an erotic novel that plays into the story. There's a story written by um, the neighbor who is a male who is trying to like infiltrate this apartment of these two women and they kind of turn his narrative and story into something else and it's just really smart. And um, I don't think I'm gonna ever do this book justice in explaining it like I do with most of these books. I feel that I will just try and give you a little bit about it and try and tell you how I felt while reading it. And from there, I hope that inspires you to pick one of these up. But if you've read any of these, let me know. If you got something out of one of these books that I may missed, please leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. Um, but yeah, these are the, I don't know why I always try and do this, but these are the four books that I read this month that I really enjoyed. So I will see you in the next one. I've got some more videos lined up, but done for my first wrap up. So happy I'm done. I don't know why these are so nerve wracking. As always, remember to read what you like, don't judge others, um, take care of yourself, and always be kind. Have a happy new year.